Hi everyone, good morning to those joining us from Europe and good afternoon to colleagues in Southeast Asia. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Southeast Asia IPR SME Help Desk and the Singapore Economic Development Board. My name is Nora and I will be today's webinar moderator. Joining me shortly will be our outstanding speaker, Marianne Tan, Region Director for Europe on behalf of the Singapore Economic Development Board, and James Kinyard, external experts for the Southeast Asia IPR SME Help Desk and partner for Marks and Clark Singapore. I'm very excited to have you all here with us to discuss an exciting topic about opportunities and risks in the smart city sector in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have observed a rapid urbanization in Southeast Asia recently, and just to illustrate you with some concrete figures, by 2030, uh, further to 90 million people are expected to have moved into cities across the region. And this con within this context, you will hear today from Marianne about smart city, op business opportunities in the smart city sector in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And James will also mention you about the opportunities, but also what to watch out for, for in, uh, in order to make sure that you land safely on the market. But before we dive straight into that, let me share with you some housekeeping rules to warm you up for this webinar. So today's webinar is recorded and you will receive a copy of the presentation and the recording file after the session. And in order to make this webinar a little bit more interactive, we will be launching some poll questions during the webinar to involve you in the discussion. So please participate. And also we look forward to a an interactive Q&A session at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to type in in the question box and we will discuss it in live at the end of the webinar. Um, let me introduce you the agenda for today quickly. I will give you a quick introduction to the IPR Summit Hub Desk project. After Marianne Tan will discuss with you about what Singapore Economic Development Board is doing and about smart nation in Singapore and how companies can participate in that. And James will tell you some uh, tips on IP protection and share with you some case studies. So just without taking too much time from you, a quick introduction to the project. So the IPR Hubdesk is an initiative of the European Commission to support small and medium-sized enterprises to protect and enforce their intellectual property rights in relation to Southeast Asia. We provide a wide range of services, all free of charge. So we have an inquiry helpline. You can get in touch with us through this helpline service and receive a tailored made answer to your IP question. So we can email you, we can have a online call with you, what suits the best for you. We offer a wide range of publications on various topics. We have IP fact sheets for all the 10 ASEAN countries and industry specific guides or general IP guides. We also have trainings on site, but I would say in 2020, mainly online, like today's webinar. So keep an eye on our events calendar to learn more about our upcoming session. And we also have some interactive learning tools such as e-learning modules, so you can learn about IP in a more interesting way. And now, without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Marianne. So, Marianne, you will be able to share your screen. Okay. That works. Okay, I see your screen. Okay. Thank you yes, very much. Yes, and I see your camera. Oh. Perfect. Okay. Um, is it covering part of my slides, though? All right. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to EU IPR SME for this kind invitation to share with you on Singapore Smart City Initiatives. Uh, my name is Marianne. I'm one of the regional directors for Europe from the Singapore Economic Development Board. So today I will be covering two main topics. The first is the Singapore Smart Nation program, uh, what it aims to do and our approach in the aspects of 
government, society, and economy. And secondly, I'll be sharing with you how companies participate in our Smart Nation effort and how you can access these opportunities. But first, let me start by providing an overview of the Singapore Economic Development Board uh, and also of Singapore itself. So the Singapore EDB is a statutory board under the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore, and we were set up to chart and implement economic strategies for Singapore. Uh, what that means is that we do three things. First, we attract foreign investment by providing support to international companies seeking to set up operations in Singapore. So for example, by providing information and connections on doing business in Singapore, and where appropriate, uh, also directing you to funding support in order to build up the capabilities that you need. Secondly, we grow industry verticals. So by understanding the needs of specific sectors and then working with the rest of government to cater to, to their needs. So this could be in the aspect of talent development, but also in other things such as uh, developing the right inf infrastructure for the aerospace sector, for example. And finally, we work with the rest of government to ensure that Singapore remains a business-friendly place for companies. So a little bit on Singapore's economy. Um, as a country, we are very multi-ethnic and multicultural, and we have a diversified economy. So sectors such as finance and business sectors, which I think Singapore is uh, fairly known for, but also sectors such as manufacturing, which continues to play a very strong role in the economy. So over 37,000 international companies uh, have chosen to set up some operations in Singapore, uh, of which about 10,000 come from the EU. And many of these have uh, chosen to base headquarters, manufacturing, and also increasingly innovation and technology teams in Singapore. So this brings me to today's topic of Smart Nation, which is very much driven by innovation and technology. So the Smart Nation program uh, is a program that started in 2014. And here I want to share two quotes from our Prime Minister uh, so, so that you understand the context of why we started it and what it aims to do. So first, Smart Nation was set up to make Singapore an outstanding city in which to live, work and play. And secondly, and this for me is key, Smart Nation is about applying technology to solve real world problems. So it's not technology for technology's sake, but really seeing how we can use technology as a tool to make our lives more convenient, uh, to make the, eco the economy more productive, etc. And this is part of an ongoing journey that actually started way before in the 1980s. So back then we had uh, the National Computerization Program, uh, where we started the process of digital uh, digitizing data and automating government systems, and then also uh, introducing computer literary, literacy programs among the population. And by the 2000s, over 90% of government services could be accessed online. And we also began to develop the tech sector as an industry in the economy. So as um, over time, it's really about using technology that was available at that point in time to continue transforming the way that we function as a, as a country. And the journey has not always been smooth sailing and we've learned many lessons along the way. And I'd be keen to hear from you uh, on what you have found the most challenging when implementing digitalization projects yourself. Uh, so Nora, if you could uh, pull up the poll question, I'd be very keen to hear from the audience on what, uh, uh, what was the greatest challenge you faced when you implemented a digitalization or a smart city project? Yeah, the question is launched, Marianne. So we give mm -hmm. some time for the audience to yeah. pick the answer that is the most suitable for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, I encourage everyone we, to select one of the answer. We give it 10 more seconds and then I will share the result and then we can discuss it, how our participants voted.
Okay, I think we can uh, share the result now. So, 13% uh, voted for strategy, another 13% for prioritization of projects, no one voted for technology, 25% said in-house expertise, and 50% change management. Can you comment on, on the selection of the answers, Marian? I think this has been quite uh, consistent uh, with what we, we have heard uh, from companies as well as our own experience. Uh, change management is one of the one of the key areas really because it's great to have the technology and oftentimes the technology is already there but it's a matter of how you use that technology uh, in and get everybody on board on the same page in order to harness the technology uh, so I'll take a pause here because this is a point that I will come back to uh, when I speak later about some of uh, the initiatives that we have in order to work with industry. So I'll go back to, thank you, thank you, Nora. So now we move on to what is Smart Nation and what are the key aspects. So we spoke about prioritization and 13% of you felt that prioritization uh, is one of the greatest challenges. So after coming on this journey for a number of years, we decided to categorize the initiatives into three buckets. First, digital government. Second, digital society. And third, digital economy. And as you can see here, digital society is really key because without society coming on board, it is actually quite difficult to implement smart city projects uh, successfully. But first, let me start with di digital government and what we aim to achieve. Uh, so digital government concerns how the government interacts with individuals and companies and also how the government interacts between its different parts. So in terms of citizen transactions, the target is for the, all government uh, services to have end-to-end -end digital options. That means that whenever an individual or uh, um, a legal entity uh, interacts with government, for example, uh, paying taxes, uh, figuring out your taxes actually, buying a government flat or even giving feedback about municipal issues, there should be an option that is entirely done digitally in terms of the forms, uh, in terms of the payment systems, in terms of the documentation. So that's not to say that we exclude an offline option because there, it's something that we always need to have uh, to ensure that government services are accessible to everyone. But the digital option is there and the aim is to make the digital transaction as, as smooth as possible. Within the government, there's also a strong effort to break down silos between agencies so that data fusion across different agencies should take less than 10 days. And also for agencies to think hard about the kind of digital transformation projects that can make a real impact. The second, the second pillar is digital economy, uh, which seeks to digitalize industries that are already in Singapore, for example, finance, uh, manufacturing, but also to build up the digital sector in and of itself. So what this means is encouraging the use of digital tools uh, to attain objectives such as productivity, uh, quality control, and smoothing out processes for better knowledge management, for example. But we also work with companies to figure out their digitalization roadmap. So in manufacturing, for example, we worked with Tusu, which is a German uh, TIC company, to come up with a smart industry readiness index. This index helps companies to benchmark their production facilities in order to identify the areas for improvement that they should prioritize. But it's not just about the technology or identifying projects. A very key part of this is also working with companies to identify how they can either upskill or uh, ensure that their, that their uh, employees understand the reasons why the company is embarking on some, of, on some of these efforts and then working on the change management aspects. Uh, and to, uh, what we have found is that a lot of, uh, a lot of companies would say, oh, okay, um, you know, these are all the technologies which could really make an impact, but it's the change management aspects. And I fully agree with the poll results 
that change management is key to ensuring that a project uh, works. So that it doesn't it doesn't just become a technology project that becomes a, a kind of like burden to everyone. So technology is very useful, but only when everyone knows how to use it and embraces it together. And finally, digital society, uh, which aims to ensure that our population is digitally ready. Firstly, as users of technology, but also being having the right skills to work in the digital economy. So I mentioned earlier the computer literacy program that we had in the 1980s. And today we continue this effort by making available an extensive range of digital causes at highly subsidized rates. So this uh, can be causes for people to learn how to use uh, certain types of software, but also uh, to equip them with the right skills in, if they want to pivot into a different, uh, different industry, for example. So to sum up, Smart Nation is about digitalization of government, economy and society to serve Singapore's needs for today and the future. So what exactly have we done with Smart Nation? Um, there have been many different projects, especially as we navigate the COVID pandemic, but I wanted to highlight a few that have been particular in, particularly important. Uh, so the first is the National Digital Identity Program, uh, which allows for seamless government transactions. So for residents, this is called a SING pass, and for legal entities, it's called a COP pass. And what this allows us to do is to transact with the government using the same login for any digital transaction. And this has now been also extended to the private sector, uh, such as to banks. Um, so under this arrangement, individuals can submit verified information securely to entities that are on the program, which really helps uh, entities such as banks uh, with the KYC process. Another program uh, is the Smart Urban Mobility Program, uh, where the aim here is to achieve the highest possible public, shared and active transport modes uh, without increasing land take and manpower, and also to move freight in the most resource efficient manner. So unlike the National Digital Identity Program, which was very much uh, an in-house project developed by our GovTech agency, a smart urban mobility is one where the private sector is an active co-creator in this process. So to give you an example, uh, we worked with Katu Nasi, which is a Belgian uh, company, a Belgian logistics company to trial using autonomous vehicles to transport goods on Jurong Island, where our petrochemical complex is. Or for example, in the city uh, at Gardens by the Bay, which is a tourist attraction, uh, we worked with a French SME called Navia uh, as part of consortium to test their autonomous shuttle in a tropical environment to understand how their shuttle could work uh, as, a, as a people mover. So all these projects are now ongoing and they continue to be enhanced over time. But we're not stopping here and there continue to be new opportunities for industry to participate in the Smart Nation story. So next I'm going to share with you uh, three platforms that we have developed in order to help companies from all over the world access opportunities in Singapore. And here I would like to pull, uh, pull up the next poll question to understand from your perspectives uh, what are the most important topics to you when you think about venturing into new markets? So Nora, if you could uh, pull up the, the poll question, please. Thanks. Yeah, we have the question. So let's give another 30 seconds for everyone yeah. to think about the question and select the, the right answer. Which topics are the most important to you when thinking about venturing into new markets? A, customer base, B, distributors and market access partners, C, supply chain, D, regulations, E, protection of intellectual property. Okay, let's see the the result. So, what we have here, 
So the majority, 43% said customer base. Then oh. we have distributors and market access partners, 29%. Then 14% protection of intellectual property and supply chain and regulations were both 7%. So is this the result you expected, Marian, or is it a little bit different? Indeed, it was. Um, I was expecting a uh, customer base and having the right market access partners to be the top, uh, and also intellectual property. Uh, but I will not comment so much on the intellectual property. I'll leave James to comment on that because he really is the expert uh, on this topic. Um, but this is a very good segue into the next few slides that I had, uh, which is about how the, some of the platforms that we have developed in order to help you access the market. So I mentioned three platforms that we have developed. Um, and the reason why we have, uh, why, why we developed this was because we identified market access as being one of the most challenging topics that international companies face when accessing the Southeast Asian market. Uh, so what we did then was to seek ways to bridge that information asymmetry to, because there are actually a lot of problem statements and issues that Southeast Asia faces uh, in digitalization. And we felt that we wanted to open up that market uh, to help companies and also governments uh, in Asia to be able to access the best technology. So first we have the accreditation and the SMEs Go Digital programs, uh, which, is, uh, which is run by the Infocom and Media Development Authority in Singapore. So these programs uh, aim to identify strong technology partners for government projects, as well as for the private sector. Uh, for government projects, we recognize that sometimes without a strong track record, it can be difficult to access uh, these projects. So this program assesses technology based on its own merit, and if accredited, it gives companies access to government tenders. So, so far over 430 million Singapore dollars worth of project opportunities have been created through uh, through the accreditation program. The second program is SMEs Go Digital, uh, which is which works two ways. So firstly, it helps SMEs in Singapore identify uh, very reliable technology partners, solution providers, uh, categorized very neatly into the different types of uh, services that they, may, that they may require, whether it is database management or cybersecurity services, etc. At the same time, it helps companies from all over the world um, gain access to this group of SMEs, which really form uh, the bedrock of the economy. So it is a searchable directory, and if you are approved, your, your products would be uh, qualified, and also you would be able to qualify for certain grants if the SMEs uh, purchase your products. So when the slides are uh, shared later, you will be able to find uh, the different processes uh, to apply for these two programs. The second platform is an open innovation platform uh, where this is not so much of, uh, so where, where there are technologies that are still waiting to be discovered. Okay. We have set up this uh, platform in order to match make problem statements with potential solution providers. And there is in fact a grant call that is open at the moment. Uh, there is a partnership between IPI, which is the intellectual property intermediary in Singapore, with the Eureka Global Stars, where a lot of European companies are participating in. So the application is open until the 15th of October, and you can go onto the platform to look at the different problem statements have, that have been put out with, uh, by, by the demand drivers. And if you find a partner and you decide to work together, you will actually qualify for funding from the two participating countries. And finally, we have the Singapore Europe Innovation Partnership Forum, uh, which is actually organized by the EDB. So this is essentially a pitch competition where technology providers had the opportunity to pitch to 20 leading Asian corporates that have specified their problem statements that they need to solve. So this is not just uh, to pitch ideas. Uh, this is really for solution providers with a ready solution 
to, to address the challenges that are faced by these corporates. So the registration deadline is 25th September, so you have still about two weeks to go. And after which the corporates will go through the submissions and choose the top 50 companies that they would like to hear a pitch on uh, in November this year. So these are three platforms that we have uh, developed in order to bridge the information gap in terms of what is being demanded by the region and what is available uh, from all around the world. We have come a long way with Smart Nation, but there still remains a lot of work to, to be done. And this, as you can see, requires a partnership between the public and private sectors. Uh, so Singapore is a hub for the region. And many companies have also then used the partnerships that they have formed in Singapore to find opportunities in the Southeast Asian and the Asian region. Uh, we have actually um, a newsletter uh, that publishes on a regular basis trends and insights on doing business uh, in, in Asia. So I would encourage you to sign up for this uh, newsletter using the QR code um, and you know, I am based in Europe, uh, but we have uh, a strong team across Europe that works with uh, companies from all over from all over the region to understand your priorities and to help you and support you wherever we can. So, sorry. Um, if you would like, uh, please feel free to drop me an email or connect with me over LinkedIn and happy to have a chat uh, on what your priorities are and to see how we can help you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne, for this insightful presentation and, and advice for the, the companies who are interested in exploring opportunities in Singapore. I think it was really useful. And now, um, without any further ado, let me hand it over to, to James to hear about uh, IP protection and some tips for companies. And then we welcome you back, Marianne, for the Q&A. Thank you, Nora. So, James, you should be able to share the screen now. Going. Yes, I see your slide. Okay. Uh, thanks, Nora, and thanks, Marianne. Um, Singapore is definitely a, a very nice place to, to live and do business, that's for sure. Um, what I'm now going to do is talk through sort of IP, so there'll be an introduction to IP, but I think also there has to be a sort of introduction as well to the Southeast Asian region and how smart cities are figuring into that as well. So before we get into that, um, I just wanted to do a poll on, have you registered any IP rights in the Southeast Asia region? Uh, Nora, is this something that you can do as a poll? Yes, the question is launched now. Great. So let's check on our participants' IP portfolio, so that will give you some guidelines for, for the rest of the presentation. Indeed. Okay, so we wait a few seconds. Okay, so let's uh, share the result. So what we see here is 50% uh, have not yet registered any IP, 20% did, and 30% not yet, but intend to. So now, James, it's uh, it's your turn to convince the ones who have not yet registered. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try my best. Right. Come to your slides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, the first thing I want to do is to give you an introduction to Southeast Asia. So the slide now that you're seeing is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It is not quite a, a trading block in the same way that the EU is, but it is making progress to go that way. And there has been some harmonization of laws, including IP laws, uh, to try to get that moving. Um, 
in terms of population as a block, it's bigger than the EU. Uh, and you can see it's about double the size of the US as a block. Uh, the biggest country by far is Indonesia, um, but nevertheless, you've got countries like the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, etc., who have a fairly substantial population. Uh, and in terms, although Singapore is down at 5 million or so people, um, when you look at that in terms of the GDP, suddenly you see that Singapore becomes a much bigger share of the ply. Um, and so it is not a market that you can easily ignore when you're looking at the region as a whole. And to put that into a bit more context, um, per head of capita, you can see that uh, Singapore uh, per head of capita is about 52, 53 thousand USD, which I think is one of the highest GDPs in the world, if not the highest. It's certainly higher than the US by quite substantial proportion. And you can see it goes right down to Cambodia at the bottom, which has about a one thousand uh, dollar GDP per head. Um, so it's a region of quite significant contrast still, um, but there are, is a significant amount of development in all of the countries at present. Now, in terms of uh, ASEAN as a whole, there has been quite a large amount of interest in developing projects for smart cities. And here is a selection across the entirety of ASEAN. So uh, Singapore has Smart Nation um, and Malaysia, which is next door. You've got at least two smart cities projects, one in Johar Bahru, which is right next door to Singapore, the other in KL. Uh, Thailand, uh, you've got Bangkok, Chonburi, uh, Phuket, and again, right across into the Philippines and all of the other countries as well. So it's mainly here to give you an idea that there's quite a large amount happening in this region and in this sector. So this again is just giving you an idea that each of the countries is actually focusing on this, going from Singapore through Thailand, etc. Okay, so when we talk about intellectual property, I, I think the two things that came out from Marianne's talk that I thought might be worthwhile mentioning here is that when you're talking about IP and you're an SME and you're looking at uh, some of these smart projects, the chances are you're going to be doing this as part of a consortium, which means other people are likely to find out confidential information. And if you don't have a, a good way of controlling that release of confidential information or your, your intellectual property and protecting it, you might be in trouble because they might then take the learnings they have from one project and use that on other projects. Um, and also another thing that came up was looking for partnerships in the region. That's great, but again, you have to make sure that you don't get in a situation where your partners decide that they're gonna protect your IP for you and then they become the owner, which causes you problems if you ever fall out. So intellectual property is basically a way of giving you a limited monopoly. It gives you a right to do something, or it doesn't give you a right to do something, sorry, but it gives you a right to stop others from doing it. So if you've got a patent, it stops others using the invention covered by the patent, but it doesn't necessarily give you a right to do it. So if you're in the space of pharmaceuticals, you need to get regulatory approval first before you would then be able to launch the product. Um, so the main sort of types of IP rights are patents, which is what most people have heard of. Uh, you've got confidential information or trade secrets, uh, trademarks, copyright, and registered designs. Um, one thing to, to bear in mind is that these rights, with probably the exception of copyright, are generally territorial uh, and are of limited duration as well. Okay. In terms of the value of IP economically, as we said, it gives you a limited monopoly and that allows you to benefit from it because it allows you to do things like work the invention yourself and stop others from doing so, or licensing the invention or whatever type of IP it is, like your brand in the region, and then you can derive royalties from it as well. Um, it is worthwhile noting that there's many different types of license that you can look at 
some could be limited to a particular product or to a particular country or even to a part of a country. Um, there can be cross licenses as well, which could be important if you're working in a space where there are standards um, where you want to access the standard. And to do that, you might need to look at having cross licenses in place to do so. Uh, another thing particularly important for small companies or startups is that IP can be used to attract invent, uh, investors to, to you uh, and it can often be the most important asset for a startup. Uh, and as I said before, if you've got collaborators, um, you have to be careful that they don't try to steal your rights um, because if you don't protect it from them, they might well do so. Uh, and that could be uh, in the form of, say, trademarks, where they decide to take your trademark and get that in Southeast Asia. That's going to cause a problem if you ever fall out. Right. Copyright basically helps you to protect an idea, or but it doesn't necessarily protect or it does not protect the idea itself. So you can protect the written words. So if you write a book, you can protect that. It protects recorded performances. Um, like music, film, or art. It can certainly protect software in smart cities, but that's the code of the, uh, the, the software, not necessarily, not the idea behind it. So it, this is not a way to protect an innovation that relates to uh, particular things that might be within the software or the processing of information, um, but it can protect the code. But it, it doesn't stop someone else working out how to do the same thing and doing it with different codes uh, and that would be a way for them to get round about a copyright in uh, protecting a software idea that you have. Uh, the time limit varies but generally it's about up to 70 years from the death of the artist so it can last quite a long time um, which is why sometimes you'll hear about the estates of authors etc uh, making money from film deals or from record sales etc long after the original artist has died. Uh, trademarks and designs. Uh, trademarks effectively are used to protect or, or to, to let people know where a product or a service originates from. Um, and it's a way for you to build up your reputation. So if you think about how that could be done, it's things like it could be a word mark or a logo mark. So smart town mobile app or a smart, the smart town could be a word mark. It's a bit descriptive, so it probably wouldn't get through alone, but you can see in the picture there that there's a logo. And so if you've got the logo, uh, in addition to the smart town and you've got a particular way of coloring in the lettering, that may be sufficient to be then able to get a trademark to that particular um, brand. It can actually be in a color. So here's the, the, the Tiffany box. That is actually the color of the Tiffany box is trademarked. Another example, um, a bit more common in, in Europe than it is in Asia would be BP Green. So uh, what used to be known as British Petroleum uh, have trademarked the color green that they use in their signage. It can relate again for a trademark to the shape. So if you think about a Coca-Cola bottle, particularly the glass bottles, that particular shape can be a, a trademark because it helps the brand stick out. And when you see that shape, you think that's from Coca-Cola and people will go and buy that product simply based on the shape, sometimes just by scanning a shelf, seeing that shape and picking it up. Uh, it can be in a jingle. So here you've got a, a, a Mars a day helps you work, rest and play. Um, which was originally developed, I think, or come up with by Murray Walker, who used to comment or commentate on uh, F1 in the UK for many, many years. Uh, trademarks can also be done on smells. So the, the smell of new cut grass for selling tennis balls, for instance, it can also be a gesture. Um, so in the UK, a uh, trademark for a gesture was the tapping off your nose three times with uh, two fingers um, in relation to financial services. And that was a, a trademark of the Derbyshire Building Society. Designs, in contrast, are limited generally to the shape or the way something looks. Um, they're normally used for 3D products. 
so they, they tend to be quite limited in scope. Uh, however, in some countries in Southeast Asia, uh, for example, Singapore and a few others, they can be used to protect graphical user in interfaces as well. So I've just given an example of the sort of the the Windows homepage for Windows 10. Okay, so as I said, uh, trademarks are generally registered for specific classifications for goods and services. Um, you can protect it as a word, etc., uh, or as a logo. And I've given you a number of examples here in the smart cities uh, space of companies and their logos and words associated with them um, that may well be protected uh, in a number of countries. Before you launch a product or, or a service, etc., and you want to use a particular trademark, um, it's important to check that that mark has not been taken by someone else before you launch um, in a new market, because it could be the case that someone else has got that mark and they're covering it for similar goods and services, in which case you might have to either fight to get the mark back if you think that should belong to you, or you might need to think about changing your mark to something else before making the entry into that particular market. So countries that protect graphical user interfaces, as I said, include Singapore. Other ones are Thailand, Philippines, and Malaysia. Uh, the good thing about designs is that they are relatively cheap compared to patents. It's much easier, and they also tend to be a lot easier to get uh, and get through. So they're a good way of getting protection for certain things, uh, like the shape of an object, if that's what you you have, or a graphical user interface, but please remember that they protect the way something looks. They don't protect the underlying functionality. And if you want to protect the underlying functionality, then you either got to think about trade secrets or you've got to think about patents. Now, trade secrets um, are basically things which you can keep away from everyone else uh, so that they can't use it or can't work out how to use it. Um, you cannot register a trade secret. It's something that you've got to keep. That means that reverse engineering is possible. And what I mean by reverse engineering is, again, if you take a drug and you put a drug on the market and you don't have a patent for it, as soon as the drug goes on the market, someone can buy the drug. They can analyze it, work out what the active ingredient is. Then they can make it and sell it and compete against you. Um, so it's about what information do I need? to be able to get there? Is it easy to uh, reverse engineer? And it's the same for software potentially. So if you have software, um, you might decide you don't want to have a patent for it. You try to keep it as secret as possible, but if you're having to share information with collaborators or collaborators are then using your software, so they work out effectively what your black box is doing so they can see what the result is and they can work out how to do something similar, then they can come up with their own product and compete against you. Um, so generally speaking, it's trade secrets are really good for processes uh, and they're good for products that are difficult to copy or for products that have a very short shelf life um, where getting a patent might not make sense because it can take between three and 10 years to get a patent granted. Um, so an example of this could be a process implemented on a server that your end users can't see uh, it's a good way also to protect uh, inventions that might not be patentable. Uh, and as we said, it's only available really if the, no one else can reverse engineer what you've done. So it is much more vulnerable um, than the other forms of IP that we discuss here. Patents, in contrast, uh, give you a right for up to 20 years uh, to stop others doing what you do. However, to get that right, you've got to disclose the invention. And the requirements are a bit higher. The requirement is that it has to be novel, so it, nothing else like it has uh, can exist already. It has to be inventive, and that can be a relatively high hurdle to overcome. And what that basically means is that it's got to solve some sort of problem or have some sort of unexpected advantage that wasn't envisaged before based on what was known in 
the the field before that uh, and it has to be capable of industrial application so basically anything that you're doing should be uh, things that can get into some difficulties can be software and I'll discuss that a little bit later on but it's important to know that this helps you to protect yourself from reverse engineering uh, over the course of that 20 year period that a patent can be enforced for so in terms of patentable subject matter and this relates to uh, being capable of industrial application if it's software based there can be problems and the, the law relating to computer-based inventions is very complex uh, and there's no simple answer so whatever attorney that you have drafting patent applications for you if you relate if you work in software uh, as an industry or, or parts of your solutions operate in the software field you've got to make sure that those are protected uh, according to at least the the same approach to what's in the EPO um, and what I mean by that is that most Southeast Asian countries will follow the similar approach to what the European Patent Office actually does so if you've got European patent attorney drafting claims for you you should be generally okay uh, and that approach basically means that there has to be a technical problem solved by the software uh, so that means that as long as there's something that is technical in nature you'll be fine if there isn't you might have trouble so an example below is something that solves a purely business related problem will not be protectable so uh, in Singapore there's a road pricing scheme uh, that dynamically calculates toll fees uh, based on the time of day that wouldn't be patentable uh, if the only new parts related to the calculating the price um, because that doesn't relate to a technical problem of course if the way or there were devices involved about how you actually get the information from the car to a reader uh, and then transfer the information back then those types of things may well be patentable what I have to say though is that Singapore is a bit more lenient uh, so if you've got a software uh, approach or a software patent that you want to get then it's possible that you'll be able to get get it through Singapore because it tends to be a bit more lenient and even if it solves a non-technical problem you might still find that you can get a patent through okay so an example of something that would be relatively easy to patent would be a computer uh, computer-based control system that receives input from a sensor network and uses that information to actively manage traffic flow uh, through a traffic light system uh, that would be considered to solve a technical problem and that would be okay because there are devices that are taking are making physical changes to devices based on sensor data that is generated okay one thing to say about the region as a whole is that in many countries in Europe it's possible to have a, distrib a distributed network so you've got a server and a client and the server's in one country and the client's in a different country and that is still fine because the claim that covers both the server and the client might still be infringed because there's this thing in most European countries known as contributory infringement uh, however in most countries in Southeast Asia that is not the case um, so if your server's in one country and the client is in a different country then if your claim covers both the server and the client the chances are that the courts are going to say that you don't infringe unless you can find a way to get something known as joint tort feasorship where you try to say that the two entities are acting together to infringe the patent and therefore they should be brought together uh, to allow you to sue uh, so that's a, a significant issue to be aware of what this means is that if you are in the software space and working with a server and a client um, you want to make sure that if you are looking for patent protection that you have claims that are directed solely to the actions performed in the territory so if the client is the only thing that's going to be in the territory you want to make sure that the actions performed on that client are covered by a claim and that claim does not then talk about the server okay in terms of Southeast Asia as a whole this slide is here just to give you an idea of the speed 
of being able to get a patent granted across these countries. What I would say is that Singapore tends to be the fastest and it has a specialized IP court system. Um, and the prosecution focus, so that's how you argue with the patent office to get something granted, has moved from being one where you can potentially rely on a case, say, in Europe, to having to get uh, it through a Singapore-based examiner. Um, most of the other countries tend to have slower speeds than uh, Singapore. Uh, some have specialized IP courts, uh, some don't. Um, most will allow you to try to rely on a corresponding case to get grant as well. Um, so it can be, in some of these countries, it can be a bit easier. Um, the caveat to that is that you've got to be careful of relying on cases where, especially in software, where there could be issues where you try to rely on, say, the US case, and the claims that would work in the US do not work in that particular country. And so it's important to make sure that you do your research in that area before you try to rely on those cases. One little plug for Singapore is that, as I said, patents can take a long time to get granted. Um, normally, you'd say it's about five years to get a patent granted. However, in Singapore, there's a fast track scheme that's in place and that can get grant for you in six months or less. Um, and here's an example of this. This was under a slightly different fast track scheme that was specifically targeted uh, to FinTech and AI, um, where grant was obtained uh, in three months, so about 90 days. So that is very, very fast. In fields with, like software, um, or fields which have a high turnover of products, getting protection fast is really important, especially if you can then get protection, say, in Singapore first and use that to then try to get protection in other countries. Now, that could be by the Patents Prosecution Highway System. Um, so Singapore is a signatory to that. So that would allow you, say, if you get grant in Singapore, you could then look at getting grants in the US, Europe, et cetera, relatively quickly. It helps you to accelerate things significantly compared to the normal pace. Uh, and in ASEAN, there's a scheme called ASPEC where you use the, the grant of the case in Singapore, again, to expedite the examination. And that could be particularly important because uh, Thailand and some of the other countries in the region, the typical time to grant is 10 years. Um, and it can be about eight or nine years before you actually start getting any engagement from the patent office. Under this scheme aspect, as soon as you put in the request, instead of waiting another four or five years or whatever it is to, before you actually get some engagement from the patent office, uh, it's about seven months. So it significantly accelerates uh, the potential to get patents granted in the region. One thing to mention also is this thing called a utility model. It's also known as a petty patent. And what that basically means is that although it normally has to be novel, uh, or it has to be novel, uh, and it's the same standard of novelty as in patents, uh, there's either no requirement for it to be inventive at all, or it's got to be uh, not obvious. Uh, or, or an innovation, so it doesn't have to meet the same hurdle for inventive step. And that means generally it's quite easy to get, uh, and that could be worthwhile getting if you're having trouble getting protection. Most of the time it's limited to products, so you can't get software or processes, and most of the time it's limited to seven to ten years, as you can see in the table on the left there. Uh, the countries listed give you an idea where utility models are available. One thing I would say, though, is that Malaysia stands out like a sore thumb because you can get protection for the same amount of time as you would for a patent. And you can get that for any type of invention, including software. So in Malaysia, if you're having problems getting a patent, then think carefully about, well, can't we, we can still change, you can change at any time in Malaysia to a utility model. So if you're having problems and the problems are all about inventive step, 
then at that stage, it might be worthwhile thinking about changing TAC to a utility model because you might well then be able to get it granted. And in some ways, you know, that might be even stronger than a patent. Okay. Um, here is just a, a warm up slide. Uh, just have a little think about how you would try to protect this. Okay. Um, obviously, you can use patents to protect features of this. So you can protect the shaver if the shaver was new. You can protect specific features within the shaver if there's particular things that have been improved, like power handling, um, blade cleaning, etc. Uh, you can protect the trademarks, like Philips. Potentially, you can protect the triangle or the, the three. Um, three-headed razor here. Uh, that's protected, I think, and still in some countries as a trademark. Not all countries allowed protection for that, but some countries did. Um, there could, uh, it's unlikely there would be trade secrets simply because you can take this home with you or someone can take it home, they can tear it apart, they can work out most of what's there. However, if there's microchips uh, with uh, protected source code, maybe there's something in that that gives you a particular process that works really well. That might still be potentially protectable as a trade secret. Um, so generally speaking, uh, and you can also protect the, the overall shape, and that could be the entire razor or it could be portions of the razor. So you might only want to protect the bottom portion and not the top portion. Or you might just want to protect the the, the fins here on the side, um, so you can select little bits as well as a design protection. So that leads into the next poll question. Here we have it. So the question is, which is the best IP type to protect a near sky edge data processor and associated free light software control apparatus? Should we show the an image, James? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, I think they are already choosing, but let me come back to. Okay. Sorry, I'm afraid that if I close the image, <laughs> the question, I may not be able to open again. Okay. So let, let, uh, let's think that everyone is very creative and they, they use it, their imagination. <laughs> I think it's there. Okay, let's see. So here is the result. So 75% patents utility model and 25% copyright and the rest uh, no one voted for. So let's show the image quickly. Okay. So what I'd say is that yes, you can certainly protect this by patents. Um, but there's associated software and control apparatus. So uh, again, ideally they, there should have been a, an option of almost all of the above. Um, because if you've got software, the software might be protected by patents, certainly by copyright. Um, but it could also be potentially protected by trade secrets. Uh, it's unlikely that the actual device itself would be protected by a trademark uh, in terms of its shape, but you've got a particular name associated with it. So near sky edge might be something that's protected or near sky might be protected and then near sky edge might be protected. Um, designs, you can certainly get a design for it as to whether or not that would be a particularly useful design to have really depends on the sector. Uh, and that comes down to how easy it is it for people to come up with a, a way for the device to look different. Um, so yes, the, the good answers. Um, I, I think there are nuances in there as well that need to be considered. 
Okay, so now I'm going to move on to a, a case study or two. So this is a British company uh, looking to get something protected in Singapore. So they developed a method, software and a device that allows information to be transmitted and received over an electrical power grid. Uh, and a significant, a significant potential market for this device was Singapore. They initially filed a PCT application, which is an international patent application uh, that covered most of the countries in the world, excluding, say, countries like Taiwan or territories like Taiwan and countries like Argentina. Uh, they then entered the Singapore national phase and then had a Singapore patent application and they were then able to get protection in Singapore to cover their invention. Um, and in this case, the invention was mainly concerned with the method and its related software. And that type of subject matter is not so easy to get a patent for in most countries around the world. Um, but it is still possible to get patent protection for it. And that's a bit easier to do in Singapore. But I should say here that in this particular case, uh, equivalent protection was also gained in Europe. So if you've got the protection in Europe, they would potentially, they would almost certainly have been able to get protection in most of the other Southeast Asian countries as well, if they had wanted to do so, or if they had thought there was a market worthwhile protecting. Okay. Uh, the second one relates to traffic control system. Uh, the picture here is of, of one of the more colorful streets left in Singapore. There are still streets like this. Um, and in this case, as a German company had developed a British, uh, sorry, a computer system uh, and a method for monitoring a traffic system uh, in order to streamline information and minimize delays for traffic users. Now, again, due to the Smart Nation program, Singapore was a market of significant interest to the company. And again, here, instead of filing a PCT application first, they filed a European patent application. Uh, and then they used that as the basis to get a Singapore application um, by claiming priority from the, the German, uh, sorry, the, the European one within 12 months. Uh, the company was then able to get the protection it wanted in Singapore. And the one thing here, to say is that the patent itself related mainly to the overall system, so the physical components, their interaction and control. Uh, and that type of protection is generally much easier to get uh, around the world and in most Southeast Asian countries. So the difference to the first one is the first one related more to the software um, and the second one here is relating more to the physical components. Where the invention uh, mainly lies in the physical components, uh, you've got a much stronger case uh, for getting over any subject matter issues that might exist. Okay, so in conclusion, there's, as you can see, there's a variety of IP protection types that you can use to get protection for applications relating to smart city inventions uh, or brands, etc. Um, it's going to be the case that the best and strongest type of protection you can get is achieved by having a mixture of different IP types. So brand protection, patent protection, design protection, etc. And having more than one patent uh, as well, because if you only got one patent and that one gets knocked out, then you're vulnerable. But if you've got a portfolio of patents that cover your product or products, then that gives you much stronger protection overall. Uh, patents themselves are the strongest type of protection, um, but they take a longer time to get granted and they tend only to last a maximum of 20 years. Trademarks can last forever if you keep on paying the renewal fees. Uh, potentially trade secrets are the same provided that you can keep it secret and that requires you to have a lot of things in place to make sure secrecy is maintained. Uh, not everything can be protected by patents. 
uh, when it comes to the innovations or the products or, uh, or the services that we've talked about. And in that case, trade secrets are a good way of going. Potentially also unregistered designs, or sorry, registered designs can also be a, an option as well if it relates to a particular product and the way it looks. So it's always important to consider your strategy early and that should be done before you disclose and launch. And so when you're thinking about filing patent applications in particular, or before you make any disclosure of a product, it's important to just take a step back and think about where the potential markets are and how you might be able to delay um, having to think or, or get protection in those markets. So the best way of doing that potentially is to, uh, for, in terms of patents is to use the international patent application which allows you to delay uh, having to make a commercial decision about the markets that you go into for patent protection for up to two and a half years from the first application that you file. Uh, and thanks very much. And the floor is now open to questions. Thank you very much, James, for this very comprehensive and insightful presentation. And now we will come to the Q&A session. So there has there was one question that we already received, but I would like to encourage the participants that it's a good time to send their questions so we can discuss it in live with the speakers here. Marian, are you also online? Can you hear us well? Yep, hear you loud okay. and clear. So actually, it's an interesting question. I would address it to the both of you and then see um, who wants to uh, address it first. So. The question is, how worried do you think one should be regarding smart city global standards that China is trying to impose now? If you have any information on that, would be happy to hear your thoughts. Okay, I, I can take it from sort of a, a perspective of just standards in IP in general. Um, mm. There are large numbers of standards uh, around the world. So if you buy a smartphone um, and it's got 4G or 5G, there is a standard behind that. So what happens is that people get together and they agree upon a standard uh, to say this is what 5G requires, this is how, this is the minimum things it needs to have and there will then be patents that fall within the standard. And the idea then for sort of this type of technology would be that people who have patents put it into a patent pool. And so that every time someone wants to build a mobile phone or, or a cell phone, et cetera, using that particular standard, they pay a royalty to the pool. And the more patents that you have in the pool, the more of a royalty that you get out from the standard. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, uh, I, I think standards tend to be more international. Uh, it's more. I think it'd be quite difficult for one country to decide that this is a standard that they're going to have uh, and force it on neighboring countries or the like. But I think in general, if there's an international standard, it's not necessarily something to be afraid of. And actually, I, I know in the um, technology fields like 5G or DVD players, et cetera, people will actually look at trying to file patent applications with claims that they think will get granted that fit in with will fit into the standard simply because the more patents that they have, the more chance they have of generating revenue or basically passive revenue by having the, pat, uh, the uh, granted patents that fit within that particular standard. Um, so from an IP side, it's not necessarily a huge worry. Um, but maybe there's there's more to think about in terms of policy if Marianne has anything else to say. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Um, so as James uh, said, the stand, having standards and standard setting is something that has existed for a long time. Um, and sometimes we see two different standards existing for the same type of uh, technology. So one example would be Blu-ray and DVD which coexisted for a period of time. I think in the same way, uh, there could be different uh, standard bodies uh, that could coexist. Then what companies would need to think about uh, which standards you would want to adhere to? Because 
it could cause a uh, bifurcation in, in your supply chain, for example, where rather than manufacturing, say, for one particular standard, which is recognized globally, you might then need to choose, do I want one standard over the other, or do I want uh, to address both? In which case, then it is, um, it is something that will take up more resources. So I think this uh, still remains to be seen in terms of how uh, China would be setting standards uh, versus some of the international standard setting bodies that have already been set up. Uh, but then this is uh, a choice that each company will need to make for itself. Hmm. Thank you very much, Marianne. And, and it's great that you both could address the, the question from a little bit different point of view. So um, while we probably receive some other questions, let me have one question to Marianne related to the Smart Nation projects. If you could tell us from which type of projects uh, you, you have seen the most part participation from the private sector side, that could be an interesting information yes. to share with our participants. Thanks, Nora. Um, so one sector, for example, is urban mobility, uh, which I spoke mm. about earlier. Um, another one is geospatial. So this, this is actually Geospatial Week in Singapore. Uh, that is organized by the Singapore Land Authority. And uh, what they have done is to develop different uh, databases as well as mapping tools. Uh, and what they want to do is to collaborate with the private sector through their geospatial industry center called GeoWorks. Uh, so, so far they have uh, invited collaborators from geolocation companies, uh, IoT, uh, in order to develop mm. solutions using the different maps that they have. Uh, even robotics companies. Um, so that's one. Uh, another, which is participation from a different point of view, is payments. Uh, so this is where the mm. private sector is more of uh, both a co-creator as well as a user. Uh, one example is the PayNow platform, which uh, allows peer-to-peer -peer transfers using uh, one's mobile phone number as the identifier. So this is a platform that has been has really gained traction in Singapore uh, and. I think most, most companies by now, any company that needs to receive payment would now offer PayNow as one of the options in addition to uh, more traditional options such as uh, credit cards and checks. Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing this, Marianne. Um, and one, one question to James um, regarding um, joint bids that if, if everything is covered by the contract, uh, should companies still worry about IP protection in Southeast Asia? Okay, thanks for that. Uh, before I answer that, I'd say that PayNow is something that works very well in, in Singapore. And it's certainly something that uh, pretty much everyone now uses for doing uh, transfers. And that extends through to sharing restaurant bills. So someone might pay for it first and then everyone else gives them money back later on. Um, okay, so in terms of joint bids and IP in Southeast Asia, as I said, one of the issues with a joint bid is how, if you're an SME, you might not be the biggest player and someone else might be the sort of integrator of the overall system uh, for the bid. And that means that a lot of your information or your confidential information or your know-how might be getting shared from yourself to another party. And you're then potentially relying on that party to play above the board. That doesn't always happen. And the contract might only cover Singapore. Um, and you've got to allow for bad players potentially um in the region so for uh, as an example of this one of the things which is fairly common here is for people to decide to have a partner uh and to have the partner handle sales etc in the region and that goes brilliantly for a number of years um but then for some reason you fall out and then you decide well actually the sales are good enough that we're going to actually take over ourselves and run our own products and services in the region. You get there, you open up your office, etc., and then you try to put yourself out using your own brand name 
and you find that you then get slapped with an infringement suit because mm -hmm. the other party, uh, you, your ex-partner, uh, has taken the liberty of registering all of your trademarks in their name. Uh, and that is something that happens time and time again in the region. And it's really important to make sure that when you're thinking about IP and the region and how you're going to enter, that you make sure that you have things in place to protect yourself as best as possible. Otherwise, you might find others taking on your IP. Um, and I know that there have been trips to the region where people have come out uh, on trade missions, uh, have then gone back and have then thought, okay, well, we're going to enter Thailand and the trade mission might have been in Indonesia. But then when you try to register your trademarks, et cetera, in the region, you find that someone had got, gone along to the trade show from say Thailand, found your uh, product really interesting and that they've registered your trademark and are now selling a version of your product in the country already. And that can cause significant problems. So in terms of joint bids, it's important to make sure that you still think out about what type of IP you've got in the region already and try to get as much as possible the, the best protection that you can get. You might not by this stage be able to get a patent, um, but certainly think about trademarks or designs, et cetera, as well as a way to get decent protection that will at least give someone else pause before they try to take your idea. Thank you, James. And I think you are touching on a, a very important point that, which is a message that the Herbus is always trying to convey to the companies that think before you go. And we, this is also the, the goal of this webinar today to, to inform companies uh, to take timely action before they start doing business in the region. This also happened to our team with the Southeast Asia Herbus. We went to a trade fair, we talked to companies. And, and I remember there was a company from one of the EU countries who told us that exactly what James said happened to him in Indonesia, that someone has already registered the trademark in, in Vietnam and just went to Indonesia for the fair from, from, a, from another country in the region. So it's really happening. So it's something very important that companies should be aware. So I don't see more questions uh, from the participants. So I think that... Um, we can close the the Q and A now. Uh, once again, thank you for the for the for our speakers today. And before you go, I just want to mention to everyone that we are doing a webinar um, in two weeks on IP protection uh, in Southeast Asia for the Internet of Things. So this will be also um, organized by a company, an IoT company in Singapore, Unabis and with Jonas Lindsay, who is an uh, external expert for the project and senior associate in Marks & Clark in Singapore. And then one more thing that I would like to show you is that we have a guide on smart cities. This was drafted by James uh, in collaboration with the help desk. And this is something that we have already started promoting. And if you like today's webinar and interested in smart cities, please check it out. And um, any company has any questions on today's webinar, feel free to get in touch with us. And we will, as I said in the beginning, we will upload the recording to our website and share the presentation with all participants. And with that, I wish you a nice afternoon. And once again, thank you for the speakers and thank you for Singapore Economic Development Board for co-organizing this session with us. Thank you, bye.